Thank you, Tiffany. Kiara Koto. Today's speaker is Dr. Chris Nieba, who's a vertebrate ecologist with Menaki Whenua, based here at our Lincoln office. And he's going to talk to us today about toxoplasmosis. So a little bit of background on that. Toxoplasmosis is a, is a parasitic disease. It infects humans, wildlife, livestock, domestic animals, and it can cross between all of those. <clears throat> Here in New Zealand, toxoplasmosis is particularly a concern with relation to sheep on the livestock side, but also native animals such as kiwi and dolphins. There are many unanswer unanswered questions about how the disease cycles between introduced species such as rodents and feral cats. So there's a number of knowledge gaps that we need to fill, and that's the topic of Chris's talk today. I will pass to you, Chris. Thanks, Graham. Kia ora koutou, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I just wanted to, well, apologize. I think a few of my slides are um, outdated from, from last night, and, and I've lost a few images, but I've rechecked them, and I think we have all the content. So let's talk talk so. So just a quick overview, toxoplasmosis is a protozoan parasite by the name of Toxoplasma gondii. It infects most warm-blooded animals, so humans, uh, domestic animals, agricultural animals, and wildlife. And it has a very complex life cycle. And that's kind of really what we're gonna be talking about today in a real applied aspect. And the complex life cycle of wildlife diseases and parasites is something that I'm particularly interested in, as well as the wildlife ecology and management team here at Menaki Finua. We are looking to uh, expand in our wildlife disease capacity um, and research. And I think toxoplasmosis is a good candidate for us to, uh, to begin work. Uh, briefly, toxoplasmosis does affect uh, native wildlife species. Um, I lost a few images here, but the top left is showing a paper from off the coast of California, and toxoplasmosis is getting into the sea otters. Um, I guess I should start off and say well, we're going to get to life cycles, but I think everyone knows toxoplasmosis is a cat disease, so it comes from cats specifically. We'll get into that, but it's making its way into the, into native wildlife, and so sea otters off the coast of California. There's some concerns of the Hawaii monk seal, the same thing happening. And then you can see in the bottom left, uh, there's a study and some, uh, I think people have, have heard recently about the Hectors and the Maui dolphins and toxoplasmosis has been the cause of mortality in multiple individuals, um, as well as uh, native bird species. So on the top right, there's a Kiwi who did recover and was released, this was from a year ago. Um, but we have had mortalities in multiple kiwis, kaka, kedudu, for example. And so it's certainly making its way into the environment and into the wildlife. So that's a concern. It's also a concern for agriculture animals, especially sheep in New Zealand. It's a significant cause of abortions. Um, the timing is actually quite critical. And so before pregnancy, if the ewe is infected, then it may cause a, a fever and, and affect the overall fitness of that ewe. But if it's caused in early pregnancy, there's a good chance that the lamb will be uh, aborted. Um, but even in late pregnancy, there's a chance that the lamb would be aborted or uh, possible death or just overall less fitness and may not um, make it a season. Following infection, these ewes uh, typically develop a an immunity, so so they don't really uh, succumb to the disease uh, once they've been infected once. The source of infection to sheep is contaminated pasture, hay, uh, food supplies, and water. And fields treated with manure or hay from farm buildings where cats live and defecate pose a significant risk of disease transmission, especially for those uh, farms that use, specifically use cats as rodent control, and then the cats are living on the hay and the hay's been brought in, brought out into the field. Um, these are some, some numbers for Hawke's Bay region specifically from a re report in 2014. Uh, potential loss of lambs due to toxoplasmosis estimated potentially up to 18 million. Um, and the cost of vaccination 
of all replacements in the region could be up to one million uh, dollars. So the vaccine is administered to replacement use each year. It's been developed for sheep here in New Zealand um, about 20 years ago. So there is a vaccination, and but there is a, a large cost associated with that, and it's not 100% effective at all. Um, some studies report potentially 85%. Okay, this is kind of a little busy uh, image, but I think many of you have seen uh, images like this. This is the Toxoplasma gondii life cycle. And I'm hoping you can see my mouse a little bit. So let's start with the cat. So this is the cat. So, so the parasite is found in cat feces. Cats are the only definitive host. It means it's the only host that has infective oocysts coming out of its feces. Now from that, they can make their way to humans. This is kitty litter. Um, if you change your kitty litter every day or two, it's fine, it takes a couple days. But most of the time, it's released into the environment. And from the environment is when humans can get it, animals can get it. Um, and this is the cycle that we're gonna be discussing mostly today. But just wanted to remind everyone that cat feces to the environment down to different animals. There are these other intermediate hosts and we will discuss and that can actually make their way back to cats. So Toxoplasma gondii infections in accidental hosts. So that's humans, that's wildlife, that's agriculture, that's anything that's not part of the normal life cycle primarily result from transmission from the environment. So that's this arrow in, in the red circle here. So almost all the accidental hosts are getting infections from the environment right here. So therefore, simply to reduce the oocyst loading in the environment, so from the cat feces to the environment, we should manage cat populations. So for this image here, if there was, if this cat was completely removed, forever, never any cats for a long term, there would be zero toxoplasmosis transmission. There are islands that, that have cats have never been exposed to, and those islands have no toxoplasmosis whatsoever. So if that's the case, if this is arrows, the main problem, is it that simple? Can we just manage cats and reduce or completely eradicate toxoplasmosis? Well, and I'll get back to that but it's not that simple, spoiler alert. Um, Menaki Finua has done some preliminary work. Here's a brief report what we were working on in Hawke's Bay, and they have a uh, general trapping regime that they're trapping multiple species, and they did target cats specifically for a while. Um, typically, they're targeting uh, getting rodents, but they have stoats and hedgehogs. So, so general predator, predator control. And what we were trying to do is find out if that, their general predator control, was influencing infection levels in sheep. And so we could do that by taking serum samples for sheep and see if they were, uh, how many were exposed and, and how many were not. Um, it was a real quick sort of crude study. Um, There's some, some design sort of problems, we had some herds that were vaccinated and some were not, and that can affect your seroprevalence. Um, but overall, what we found was that sheep seroprevalence was highly variable at multiple sites and over time. And there was a knockdown effect of feral cats initially, um, but that didn't last for very long. And so ultimately what we observed with the normal sort of trapping regime, including a, a little bit of um, targeting cats, was that likely more cats need to be targeted and for a long-term control um, to prevent any sort of long-term effect of infections in sheep. So what that means is it, it was more complicated than removing a few cats. And one of, the, one of the things that is probably a cause of that, more complications, is the environmental persistence of toxoplasmosis. A single cat can shed over 20 million oocytes, excuse me, and some reports say over 100 million oocytes into the environment from a single cat. And these oocytes can remain effective 
infective in soil and fresh water for up to a year and salt water for two years. So it's persisting. So if you remove cats completely from the environment, it's still there. And if cats move back in, they could pick it up and start the life cycle all over again, as well as it will take a long time to, to notice any measurable effects in any of your non-target species or your um, accidental hosts, excuse me. Well, let's talk cat specific. So cats, again, are the definitive hosts. So the oocyst shedding typically occurs early in life. So the first time, the primary infection, the first time a cat's infected is when they will release the majority of the oocyst. Often they, they can acquire some immunity, um, not completely and not always, depending on, on certain scenarios, but often it's the first time they're infected. So that's usually a cat that moves into an area or a, or a younger cat. It's also all cats aren't created equal when it comes to toxoplasmosis transmission. For example, unknow, unowned cats, excuse me. So that could be strays or ferals. And the difference really is sort of strays are not owned by anybody, but they're sort of associated with, with humans um, and human food or rubbish or anything like that. And ferals um, are not associated and not reliant on anything human or out, or out in the bush. But um, for both of those, they have shorter lifespans. So really only a few years compared to pet cats. Um, they breed more rapidly as well. So based on that first bullet, that means that the unknown cats, the feral cats especially, would be a priority for control because the turnover of them are gonna be much quicker and you're gonna have more naive individuals in the population of ready to be infected, so susceptible individuals. We also need to discuss intermediate hosts and we'll get back to that entire, that entire life cycle. But here's a, here's a subset of that first one that you saw on the right. Um, and intermediate hosts typically are rodents, but they could be other species. They're disease reservoirs that can hold the, hold the parasite and then the cats can, can um, become infected from them and not just from the environment. And if you can see on this life cycle on the right, um, the traditional, the main route of transmission from cats is cats, that DH is definitive host, to the environment, then to the intermediate hosts, and then to the rodents. So the size of the arrows, arrows, excuse me, is the primary source of infection. Infection in cats occurs at a much, a much higher rate from predation on infected intermediate hosts than from the environment. This is really important. This is one of the most important uh, bullets of this presentation. This is sort of leading some of our research. So you can see this arrow here that's pointing to the cats. It's larger and more bold than this arrow. It's because it's more important. Cats can get infected from the environment. And then they, and this is, they can, you can remove anything else and then they can become infected in, in, a, in a cycle. But the majority of time that, that an uninfected cat becomes infected is from predating on an intermediate host. So this arrow right here. And often this can be ignored or understudied, especially in a management focus. Um, and there's also varying predation rates, so unowned versus owned cats. For example, um, studies have shown that that uh, unknown cats, so strays or feral cats, feral cats even more than strays, are more infected with toxoplasmosis than pet cats. And really the, the reason for that is they're predating, they have a higher predation rate on, on rodents, so they're increasing the chance they're gonna uh, feed on an infected rodents. Uh, someone's pet cat may run out and eat some, but they have all that supplemental food sources as cat food. So <clears throat> getting back, is it that simple to just um, manage cats, any cats at any time for how long? And then will that um, help control or manage the disease? Well, no, and I think we've alluded to that. So again, on the bottom right is that initial, that overall life cycle and all that spillover to all these animals. We're gonna focus on that within that orange circle, and that's that very top section. We've already seen that, and that's what we're gonna focus on. Definitive host cats, the environment, and intermediate host rodents for management. So one way that we wanna research for potential management is with modeling, and epidemiological modeling. And there have been several modeling studies out uh, um, in the world, not for New Zealand, 
that have investigated the impact of management practices and infection on tox of toxoplasmosis <clears throat> in farm systems specifically. Uh, one is Eterno, Turner et al. Um, 2013. And what this model explored was not only transmission pathways, is what we're looking at here, but potential control mechanisms. So different control regimes to find out what can reduce or possibly eliminate the disease. Um, and then on the bottom here, this is all from that. This is just to show you how complicated it is <laughs> with, all, with all these. And this is only a subset. So it's a lot of maths and it's a lot of modeling. And we have, we have a, um, a pretty, pretty good modeling team here as part of our wildlife ecology and management team. Um, and so just for example, on this bottom left, you don't have to, it's too busy, but just, just look that these are cats. So these are, these are definitive hosts, susceptible individuals, infected, recovered. This is the environment. And then these are mice. And so it's the same thing that we're seeing here up on the top. And they're just plugging in numbers and parameters and they're measuring things. So some of the important factors and parameters we need to consider in some of this modeling is the carrying capacity of cats. So how many cats can can be in an area, um, density and abundance. So environmental infection in cats. So if we just have cats, and the more cats that we have, the more infections into the environment there are going to be, and the increased likelihood that cats will become infected again from the environment. And so that's that cycle. So that's very important for this cycle in black, the black arrows to understand carrying capacity and just abundance of, of cats in the wild. Another important parameter is predation rates. And we alluded to different types of cats have different predation rates. Um, and that is very important for, it's just the same overall life cycle, but these bold arrows here. So the traditional most common life cycle of toxoplasmosis, cats to the environment, the environment to the rodents, the intermediate host, and then back to the cats. We really need to know the predation rates. And, and that relates to densities and abundance of the cats, but also of the rodents, and also of mice versus rats, and the different types of, of cats that we discussed. And the third one is actually quite interesting, and this is the vertical transmission in intermediate hosts, so the black arrow. So you can have transmission that just goes from rodents to rodents that does not involve cats and does not involve the environment. And what vertical transmission is, is that the mother to the offspring, can, an infected mother can pass toxoplasmosis to her offspring and the offspring becomes infected. And it's been shown, especially in mice, up to nine generations of vertical transmission. So not only if you remove cats from the system, for example, and you have you have O assist persisting in the soil and the water for a year or two, you can have them in in these intermediate hosts. And so to ignore that that factor, that component of the life cycle, um, would be doing you a disservice, especially for for management approaches. So all three of these are very important. So some of this modeling and specifically that, that study, and again, this is sort of general theoretical models that what we would like to do is tailor them um, to the New Zealand situation specifically. So let's look at that first, that first uh, section of that, that transmission cycle. So the black arrows, again, the environmental infection from cats to environment to cats. So environmental risk to cats increases as the carrying capacity of cats and increase. So the more cats that exist in an area, the, the risk to the environment and then back to cats increases. And that's pretty obvious. So for example, the, for very densely populated regions, no other life cycle is necessary. So if you have enough cats, you only need those black arrows. You can ignore all the gray arrows and, and it's fine. And you're still gonna have transmission, continuous transmission or persistence. Okay, let's look, look at the predator prey cycle. So this, these black arrows. So for moderately high predation, um, whatever that means, and that can be relative, relative to a scenario, and we want to investigate that for New Zealand. For moderately high predation, the predator prey cycle is all that's necessary. So if you have enough cats eating infected rodents, then all you need is that those black arrows, and you can ignore any of the gray arrows. 
And also interestingly is for very sparsely populated regions with low predator prey life cycles. So for example, um, urban areas, um, also potentially following control if, if, you've, if you've controlled cats and cats are down to a very low, low uh, density, then vertical transmission in the intermediate host, so the rodents, is a deciding factor for disease persistence. Now, obviously, eventually they'll have to make their way back to the cat, so you can't ignore this gray arrow forever. But what this says, in, in certain scenarios, this is the most important route of transmission for disease persistence, um, especially long-term. And so a quote from that paper says, a parasite struggling for survival, um, and that could be when you're reducing, you know, there, there's very few cats, so it's not completing its normal life cycle. A parasite struggling for survival would benefit most by increasing vertical transmission in mice. So this is a very, can be a very important component, and we'd like to investigate that. Um, and another sort of a simulation from this type of modeling, this is a very, very crude simulation, but what it's looking like is that it's what we'd like to explore and what this is exploring is, is combinations of different control regimes. So uh, I'll, I'll walk you this real, real briefly here, but the um, X axis here and this H is for harvesting rates of mice, so, so mice control. And on the y-axis is cat control, but the V stands for vaccinations. There aren't really cat vaccinations or, or they're exploring that, but this is theoretical. So it's not removing cats from the landscape, um, but it's vaccinating them for toxoplasmosis. So it, it, essentially removing them as viable hosts. Um, in New Zealand, we would probably try to create the model for actually cat control. Um, we'd also like to create the model for this to be for for rats as well. But regardless, what this is saying, this blue line is actually for disease eradication. Um, so for example, right here, if you're on the blue line, 90% of cats, if they were controlled in this scenario, then you could have disease eradication. And anything else on this blue line is also eradication. So if you go all the way to the end, theoretically, 20%, if you only control 20% of cats, but you also add six, as little as, oh, move that, as little as 6% reductions in mice, then you can achieve disease eradication. Um, again, it's very theoretical, but in other words, the model suggests that if you control mice, you, you don't have to control cats as much um, to achieve eradication. And, and that's really interesting to us, and we'd like to explore these different regimes. Now, we know that if you can control and reduce rat numbers, then sometimes mice numbers can go up, and certain, certainly sometimes during the seasons there are rodent eruptions. So we'd like to, to, to consider all those factors, but um, if cat control is certainly something that um, people are doing anyway, unless and especially if they want to target cats specifically to um, control or eradicate uh, toxoplasmosis then we need to understand not only understand what's going on with the rodents but understand what any sort of rodent control that's already been going that's been being conducted as well as any new control what that can do for our overall management success so um, again we would like to create a new zealand specific model that would again focus on transmission pathways and those potential control mechanisms. So those different um, trapping regimes, whether we trap just cats or just rodents or a combination of both. Um, and then all these, all this busy numbers and arrows and things, we would just create a very New Zealand specific version of that. Um, and I believe this is my final slide. So in summary for our interests, um, uh, of pursuing toxoplasmosis research, we do need to understand the role that these intermediate hosts, these rodents especially, um, play in transmission um, of toxoplasmosis in New Zealand, and we really don't know that. Um, I didn't touch much on um, the strains, but there are, I should have said there are hundreds of strains worldwide. Um, the majority of the wildlife, for example, that have been affected in, tox in New Zealand by toxoplasmosis has been of one specific strain. Um, and we need to understand what 
hosts have what strains, and some strains are very virulent, and they're the strains of importance. Um, we need to know what's happening in the mice, what's happening in the different rat species, um, and also potential other intermediate hosts. I mean, rabbits, and rabbits are a large prey for, for cats here in New Zealand. Um, Again, oh, sorry, I guess I jumped ahead, but that second bullet was those strains or those genotypes. It's very important to understand what we have and where we have it. Um, and if you take serum samples from sheep and, and other things, for example, you can't always identify exactly the genotype. It's really important to do molecular work and understand from tissue samples um, exactly what strains we have and, and where. We'd also like to research investigating potential management regimes. And again, this, this is um, certain levels of complementary rodent control with cat control. And then, um, for example, in multiple, surrounding multiple sheep farms and then testing those sheep and seeing if we're um, uh, influencing the infection levels or even, even uh, sampling the rodents themselves and using them as a, a sort of a, 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 a uh, sentinel for, for that measuring that the change in, in um, disease over time, infections over time. And also just the bioeconomics, because we do know that that um, the vaccinations in sheep uh, can help. It doesn't help completely. It's not 100 percent. But when is something more economical than not? And when is trapping um, more beneficial uh, short term or long term? And also we have other questions about what, what other animals, and I mean, typically the risk to humans is undercooked meat, and, and especially in New Zealand, often we, uh, we'll, we'll eat uh, sort of uh, undercooked venison and things like that, and, and are they found in these other species? Is there any risk, risk to humans um, or even to complete the life cycle out in the wild? Um, or are any of these species just acting as sentinel species? Can we, can we test waterfowl um, that are already being hunted, for example, and finding um, changes over time and is it a good way to identify the spread of certain uh, virulent strains, specifically ones maybe that are making their way into the uh, waterways, into the dolphins. And I don't know how I did on time. Um, I think I was a little over, but it, it, if anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to email me. And I'd like to to thank really our whole team that is starting to pursue this. Uh, I didn't put any names because again, we, we, uh, we're early stages, but we're, we're hoping to do lots of field studies, molecular studies and modeling studies. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I think you did a, a great job of kind of highlighting how this really is a very complicated system with a lot of unknown questions still to be answered. Uh, I should have said at the start of the talk that we are very happy to take questions and there's a, a panel off to your right that you can type questions in. Uh, we've used up a half hour, but we are happy to stay here and deal with those questions. Um, if we completely run out of time, Chris will answer them by email. So free, free to, um, to stick around and uh, ask or listen. So I'll kick off, Chris, with a few of the ones that have come in. Uh, and the first of those is ones that I'm interested in too. Uh, do we have any figure for the rate of toxoplasmosis exposure to humans in New Zealand. Uh, the, the person that asked the question commented that he thinks the rate's about 20% in the US, and, and I can support that. I think it's at least 20%, possibly even higher. So it's really a surprisingly prevalent uh, exposure in the human population, but fortunately most people don't get sick. Do we have any equivalent figures in New Zealand? Um. I don't know them. Um, I believe there's been some previous research, and so I apologize. But I think it, it's very understudied generally in, in New Zealand. It is an interesting thing where it can be, uh, lots of people can be affected and it's sort of um, benign or latent in them. Um, and most people, as far as I know, we're not really looking at it much here. It doesn't seem to be an acute infection problem in New Zealand. Um, but there has been in measurements, even in, in Australia has recently come out with an article that says cat diseases and it's toxoplasmosis and a few other ones, but cat diseases is overall causing $6 billion in, in damages to uh, Australia's economy. And a lot of that is agriculture, but some of that is related to those latent infections and then uh, causing car accidents because humans uh, sort of lose a little bit of, of fear and things like that. And I didn't touch touch on that. So I guess that's yeah. my way of saying I don't know in New Zealand, but it's certainly um, certainly probably occurring. Yeah. 
And I guess a connected question, uh, we had a listener ask, um, how how do you detect toxoplasmosis in wildlife? And I guess there's two aspects to that, like in live animals and also in carcasses. Yeah, that's right. So uh, briefly, I won't get into it too much, and some of it's even over my head, but, but briefly for live animals, when you, when you take a blood sample and you spin out the serum, and that's, that's how you can find if something's seropositive or not, uh, looking at serial virus, and you can't, you can tell if they have been exposed at some point, but you can't necessarily tell if they're infected currently, and it's also difficult to understand the, those strains, those genotypes. So really, it's tissue samples, and that, it's actually, and I didn't touch on this, but something that we're collaborating, Massey's uh, sort of leading the way in some of this uh, molecular sampling work on toxoplasmosis, Wendy Rowe and, and many others, and we're collaborating with them right now on testing different organs of rodents specifically. We're looking at rats. Um, I'll probably play a, more, a little bit more of a role than mice in the forest transmission because less mice. And we're sampling different organs, um, including the tongue, um, which overseas people have had good success. And that may, that may be a great sort of an easier way to sample for dead animals than inside uh, internal organs and also the traditional sampling of brain that can sort of be inconsistent because it's um, sloppy and things, but so, but organ sampling and molecular assays, and we're trying to sort of perfect that to to to, to make it easier for wildlife sampling in in New Zealand. So a follow up question to that, which you probably can't answer too easily, and so that's a question that we can get back to people by email, but I'll ask it anyway because I had the same question. Um, I'd like to hear more about treatment of infected native birds, and. Um, I thought that was really interesting that you kicked off the talk with a, a recovered kiwi. So, I mean, that's really encouraging that it is possible for wildlife to become sick, but then uh, recover again. You're right. Uh, and I didn't really touch on that. And, and uh, it probably wasn't necessarily the best example. Um, it was a positive example. Um, and uh, that that was that was online. There's been some papers on that. And I think a lot of it is, is sort of over time and just making sure that they um, that any of those acute uh, infections they're they're fed and they're taken care of and and I don't know of any actual um, medicine treatment um, but again that's sort of occurring and then led by a lot of the groups at Wild Base at Massey but as far as I know it's not a a treatment per se I think they sort of um, supportive care. Yeah, supported care, and and you know, anytime a, a animal can succumbs of disease and increases the the risk of um, mortality by the elements and by predation. So I think it was more of that. Um, but I can look into that, and if you email me, I can I can find the real answer. Yeah. Uh, so you had somebody that asked just to clarify how long toxo can survive in the intermediate host without having to go to a cat, and uh, I think the answer to that was at least nine generations. In mice, it's a lot less in, in, in rats. I think the vertical transmission themselves is, 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 doesn't occur as frequently. Um, but certainly as long as the, uh, the individual rodent, you know, is alive. And the rodents are picking them up again from the, from the environment. And so, yeah, you can really get those, those cycles um, going for a while. And, and somebody asked similarly, uh, is it possible that birds could be involved in that kind of vertical transmission cycle? That's a that's a that's a great question, and I don't know. They're certainly in, involved in that that middle of those three for the the uh, predator prey cycle. Cats can become infected. Birds can act as intermediate hosts as well, um, just as other mammals probably can too. Rodents are sort of the most studied and have the most studied in vertical transmission. I don't know about birds and how that goes through the eggs. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, so this one's a comment, but I think it's a good comment, and we. Good to hear your opinion. Um, so the comment is that the discussion on feral versus stray cats, uh, there's a huge number of stray cats that will be involved in these kinds of cycles when they live on the edges of urban rural divide and do in some cases intermingle with humans. Um, stray cat social and unsocial number is very large. Feral cats by definition aren't reliant on, on human resources. But most of the cats that we see in and around farming systems will therefore be stray because they will have some interaction. Right. Um, this speaks to the need to get national level, national level legislation to support 
uh, resolution of the stray cat and white cat issue. Ferals are managed by DOC, but it doesn't seem like anyone is really responsible for managing strays in any real sense. So what do you think of that point? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a real good point. Uh, I won't speak to the, um, to the, the yeah, the policy recommendations necessarily, but I can tell you from the research side, absolutely, we need to understand them more. But but on the management side, yeah, they need to be managed. So lumping strays with ferals for those unknown, uh, sorry, excuse me, unowned cats, again, was the the priority for definitive host management. Um, now, again, by definition, ferals are not um, relying on human uh, sort of resources more or less and strays kind of are but strays can be very feral um, and almost very domestic there no, nobody owns them but they're still feeding them on a certain quarters corner so the the term stray is really broad and kind of covers a, you know, a little bit of domestic and a, and a little bit of um, feral but but yeah, that's a very interesting point about specifically managing, and it probably has to do with the with the uh, the land manager and whoever that is, and and if those strays are not on the traditionally managed feral cat locations, um, that should, probably should be yeah looked into because they're certainly a very important part of this um, disease cycle, and especially if their numbers are higher, um, they're they're of course playing the role. They're the, they're the definitive hosts, um, and it's unless you manage them and understand what they're doing. Yeah. So good comment. Yeah. Because uh, you mentioned that dolphins have been exposed, and so that's oocysts traveling from the land, you know, into the marine system. Do you think that um, you are they being washed? Is it people putting kitty litter down the toilet? Do we have any idea of the sort of routes? That, uh, that lead to that kind of transmission from terrestrial to aquatic systems? Um, it's not my my direct wheelhouse. Um, and, and, and by the way, there was recently a, a toxoplasmosis workshop that was put on by DOC, specifically in their marine division, with a focus, an emphasis on the tr transmission routes or lack of knowledge of transmission routes to the dolphins. And we had uh, lots of different people um involved in that in, uh, including myself and and you graham the, the moderator um and all those theories are valid um it only takes one oasis to infect an animal like a dolphin and so they're certainly making their way to the water um in california there is some concerns of flushing kitty litter down down toilets and and where that goes and i'm not exactly sure how that's working here but it doesn't have to be. It can be runoff. It can be from from the wild. So we really don't know here in, in in New Zealand specifically. But we know that the Maui's or the well, that Hectors in general, I believe Maui's a subspecies. Don't quote me. But have been in, infected and mort mortalities caused on both sides of the country, on the west coast and the east coast. Um, so we know it's making its way in, in multiple locations. But that's a really good question. And one of the outcomes of that workshop was that's a priority to investigate those transmission routes. How does it get there? Um, but again, on the um, management side, and a lot of the outcomes of the solution was, well, if we want to manage it, to control it or eradicate it or reduce it, it's to manage it terrestrially and manage it in cats. And I don't disagree, but I think that sort of the thesis of this talk was maybe not just cats or which cats. Um, yeah. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions about vertical transmission. Can you tell us kind of how that's happening? Like, is it across the placental wall from the mother to the fetus? If, if it was that, you know, would that apply in birds? So any more light you can shed on that? Um, there, there are some, there's some good literature on on that. And so you, can, you can Google it. In the United States, the Center of Disease Control, the CDC has some information on the website, more in humans. But yes, I believe the humans, which, which if a, if a, a female, a woman is pregnant woman is infected at a certain time during your pregnancy, um, the child can become infected. And I believe that is through the placenta wall. Yes. So I, I think it's, a, I believe it's very similar um, in the rodents, but the exact physiology, um, I probably really shouldn't speak to that. 
um, here. But again, it's it seems to be in, in laboratory experiments um, much more prevalent. Uh, it occurs more in, in the mice uh, than the rats. Rats. Uh, and just back to the humans for a second, we've had a comment come in. Seroprevalence studies in New Zealand are limited, but testing of blood donors from the Waikato region indicated that seroprevalence among that sample was 93, 43%. <laughs> okay. So that's uh, pretty eye-opening and kind of emphasizes the importance of learning more about this. Yeah, it, it is. Again, I mean, regardless of, of, of how, if it's if it's sort of a, uh, benign or, you know, not an acute, you know, infection, it means it's really, yeah, it means it, it, it's out there. It's getting into the environment and it's getting into people and it's getting into animals. It's getting into animals of, of, of concern, um, wildlife, uh, domestic animals. It's also getting into other animals that are contributing to the life cycle. So certainly, I don't want to say saturating in, in the environment, but certainly it's making its way um, into many things, and 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 we really need to understand a little bit more with a very New Zealand um, specific context. Yeah. And speaking of super New Zealand specific, um, somebody asked, are bats at risk? As far as we, as far as we know, as far as I know, um, no. Um, th that has been touched upon on a couple of reports, and and I think even um, there has been some sampling. And so, uh, as far as we know. Um, in New Zealand, no. And as far as we know, I think globally, it's not a concern or ever been detected. Um, yeah. Uh, I have probably missed some questions because they were kind of scrolling through, and I apologize if I have. Um, let's wrap it up. So we're 15, min 15 minutes over time. Um, I will say a couple of the comments that came in were people saying, are you looking for samples of cats or rats or mice? Um, so we'll follow up with those folks. Thank you for the offer. Um, thank everybody for joining us today. And thank you, Chris, for an interesting presentation. Uh, I hope you'll have the opportunity to come back tomorrow. There's a couple of biosecurity bonanza sessions on weeds. And then on Thursday at 10.30, Erica Hendricks from our group will be back uh, to give a presentation on the hunt for species-specific toxins for vertebrate pests. So thanks everyone and hope to see you then. Thanks.